I'm Pat Doris. Welcome to the story. All the ways to communicate with us right there at the bottom of the screen. You can email us. The address is the story at KGW.com. You could also use the hashtag the story KGW on Twitter or leave us a voicemail. Call our phone number 503-226-5090. We begin tonight with an uncomfortable but important story about fentanyl. It's a drug that is ravaging our country and our local communities. A local family now shares their heartbreak and devastation after their teenage son, Griffin, died from a fentanyl overdose. They're opening up in the hope that you will understand the dangers and that another family can avoid their nightmare. He was extremely, extremely witty and funny. I mean, mature humor from the time he was like five or six. And by his sophomore year of high school, his mother says Griffin Hoffman had grown into a teenage tennis star, a young adult with a big heart who was still a kid at heart. I miss every last thing about him. It's really difficult to talk about when when you're talking about your son. Missing. But Carrie Cohen wants the world to know about the anxiety Griffin suffered like so many teens during the pandemic, experimenting with cannabis, then prescription pills. I also had many conversations with him and so did his dad about, um, about the dangers, you know. I, he, he knew there are a few things you never ever do. But it sounds like you wanted him to talk to you about all of this. Definitely. And we made it very clear, like, you're not going to get in trouble. This is what it matters is discussion. <laughs> then on a Monday morning in March, a school day, Griffin's father went to wake him up. His dad threw open the, my bedroom door and said, Carrie, get up. Something's wrong with, with Griffin. But the first thing I saw was his hand because his dad was holding it, trying to find a pulse and there was no pulse and it was just blue. Did you? already have a sense about what might have happened. I figured in the beginning that he took something. He must have taken something and not known. And right away they found those blue pills. Pills like these that Carrie would later find out looked like oxycodone, but were counterfeit, made with something a hundred times stronger than morphine, fentanyl. My kid wasn't an addict, you know? He was just doing normal experimentation like any other kid. He was just like a regular teenager. The fact that it happened to my kid is evidence that it could happen to anybody's kid in a lot of ways. Investigators say they were able to trace back who those very pills came from, from a street dealer that handed them to Griffin, then up two levels to a 24-year-old alleged drug trafficker they call a merchant of death a federal indictment naming him as Manuel Antonio Souza Espinoza of Vancouver, caught in late March with this bag of fentanyl pills and a firearm, investigators say, during an operation with a lower level dealer who cooperated. Espinoza facing 20 years to life, if convicted, court filings read, for selling fentanyl that resulted in the death of a child. The defendant's lawyer did not respond to a request for comment. We asked the, the um, district attorney, who was the last person who knew what these things were and that they could easily, that probably might kill. And they told us every last one. Really? Yeah. Last year alone, we had 11 deaths in the state of Oregon uh, from young people under the age of 18. And while U.S. Attorney Scott Ospog declined to discuss the specifics of Griffin's case, the explosion in Oregon of the synthetic drug that's easier to transport and cheaper to make means his office is battling an epidemic. We can't prosecute our way out of these cases. What's important is that kids understand, that young people understand, that what they're taking has the high potential to kill them. Please make sure that you are not taking these pills. They are designed to look like oxy. Is Which no is why the principal at Griffin School, McDaniel High in Northeast Portland, posted a plea a day after the 16-year-old died. We're going to take the pills from you. We will not be asking any questions. The grief is going to stay with us for a very long time. What have you personally 
learned over the last few months? It, it wasn't clear, the, the, the level of the danger and, and how prevalent they are in what our students potentially and what the community is potentially buying. If you're buying anything on the street, it's fentanyl. And now it's much more clear. Much more clear. And that's in part due to a flurry of public health warnings issued to show, color aside, that prescription pills on the left here and counterfeit fentanyl on the right can look nearly identical. With experts pointing out it takes just a few grains, less than the tip of a pencil, to prove fatal. When we're seeing people OD on half a pill, sometimes potentially even quarter of a pill. And Lieutenant Chris Lindsay with Portland Police Narcotics and Organized Crime shows us. I mean, this is pretty typical for how it's all shipped up in bulk like this. The surge has grown so great. This section of this vault is dedicated exclusively to fentanyl storage. In their secure drug vault, fentanyl has its own section. These are counterfeit oxycodone pills. I and mean, they're all marked evidence. They all say suspected fentanyl or fentanyl. There's a lot here. How many pills in here? Probably hundreds of thousands. Probably hundreds of thousands. In 2021, Portland police say they secured over 300,000 confirmed or suspected fentanyl pills. In the first five months of this year, they've already brought in 90% of last year's totals, with teens an easy target. Apps like Facebook, Snapchat, and Telegram are huge. Um, we're seeing it on the dark web as well. This is very preliminary. We're starting to see them come in the form of counterfeit Xanax. Now, the little white Xanax bars, this stuff is dangerous. This is what it looks like, and it can kill you. There's no, there's no redemption. I mean, the worst thing in the world happened to me. The worst thing in the world that every parent's biggest fear is what happened. The reality of her son's death still so raw, Carrie can't bear to look at pictures. Yeah, I can't. Instead, this mother finding her memories and comfort in an enduring symbol of his life. I got a tattoo of a griffin to commemorate him. Yeah, my life pulse, you know. At the biggest heart, I mean, he cared so much about people. That's what I want. I want people to remember his humor and his heart. His humor and his heart, she says. And Griffin, by the way, is not the only one. Another student at the same high school also died from a counterfeit prescription pill less than 24 hours before he did, Pat. It's just so heartbreaking. And not surprisingly, David, we've had viewers who've watched your piece sending us follow-up questions mm. now about Griffin's story. Let's start with Barry, who asks, if drug dealers sell deadly fentanyl to unsuspecting users and it kills them, who's left to buy their goods? You know, it's a great question. And the first thing I want to point out is while we focused on teenage deaths here, the explosion in fatalities is really across the board. So let's show you a breakdown from 2019 to 2021. You can see among children and teens that increase from no deaths in 2019. That's on the far left to 11 dead in 2021. As we move to the right, you can see that trends continue. We move up in age and with the totals at the end there. Keep in mind, these 2021 figures are only through September, so we expect those totals on the far right, that number 300 and something, to tick up to say nothing of what we've seen this year. You've also heard Portland police say they've confiscated nearly 300,000 pills this year in Portland alone, which means essentially millions upon millions have flooded Oregon and beyond. Here is the thing. The DEA estimates about 40% of those pills contain a lethal dose of fentanyl, so one day, could be a legit pill. The next day could be filler like aspirin, and the third could be the one that kills you. Chris Lindsay there also pointing out when the cartels make this stuff, that fentanyl is not evenly distributed. So you end up with chunks here and there, meaning instead of one pill can kill, it could be a quarter of a pill or even less. It also makes using those test strips we've talked about in the past far from foolproof here. Yeah, I've heard people talk about it's like making, you know, cookie batter. They just sort of stir it in and maybe exactly. you get a, a really strong dose one place and not the other. Here's another question from Joan about the vault. Seeing the amount of fentanyl in that drug lockup was just staggering. 
You, I'm curious, why is it there and not destroyed? You know, Joan, thanks for that, because I have the same question. It is all evidence, yes, in ongoing cases, some dating back to 2017. You will notice that we didn't actually show you the full labels with the case numbers and the investigators names. Police actually requested that we be judicious in our edits of the raw footage there, including the exact location of the vault, by the way. They did tell me that once the drugs, be it fentanyl or meth or heroin, are no longer needed for cases, yes, they are destroyed. Pat, one thing before I go here, I should mention the suspect in this case, Manuel Espinoza. He's due back in court in July. As of right now, the U.S. attorney tells me nobody else has been arrested or charged in connection with Griffin's death. Now, his mother, Carrie Cohen, tells me not only does she want those responsible to be held accountable, not only does she want them to show remorse, she wants something she calls hopeful thinking. She wants them to care. Mm. Pat? You're looking forward to this all being done with. All right. Thanks for your great report, David. You bet. The Federal Reserve is raising interest rates by three quarters of a percentage point. That's the largest increase since 1994. The goal is to slow the rapid inflation we're seeing across the country. But how will this impact you and your family? Investigative reporter Evan Watson explains the individual impact. The Federal Reserve, the nation's central bank, wants to cool off inflation that's running at a 40-year high. An interest rate increase has the goal of ultimately lowering prices, but it also will make borrowing money more expensive. One major example, it'll cost more to buy a home. So housing really stands out um, right now. The sharp rise in mortgage rates to almost 6% uh, is really a, a big change in that, that market. Oregon economics professor Tim Dewey says with already high housing prices and surging mortgage rates, some people may wait to buy a house until interest rates or home prices fall. You could also see car loan monthly payments or credit card interest rates rise. And if um, inflation does not start to fall, uh, the Federal Reserve will keep raising interest rates and hold interest rates high even as uh, economic activity slows. A byproduct of this, the Fed projects the unemployment rate will steadily grow either through pauses in hiring or layoffs. Echo Northwest Senior Project Director Bob Whalen says businesses will respond to a tightening economy. When demand goes down, prices will go down. That's the hope. Uh, you're slowing the economy. It'll bring up the unemployment rate some. Uh, so find a job you like and keep it is, is the goal here. Banks may also be more careful about who they lend to due to increasing interest rates. So you may need a higher credit score in some cases. Outside of the goal of lowering prices and curbing inflation, Wayland says the hike could have another positive effect for your bank account. What it is good for, though, is uh, it will improve the return people get on their savings, which is important for a large segment of the population. The Fed projects it will raise interest rates multiple more times this year which Dewey says could create a high risk of recession. Aren't actually attempting to induce a recession. Uh, however, um, uh, it's uh, increasingly likely, and I think they know it. Dewey and Whalen both say the Fed waited too long to increase interest rates, and people should manage their money with the expectation that some savings may be needed later this year. Keep money in the bank. Just build a little cushion for yourself to protect yourself just in case this does fall into a recession. Evan Watson reporting for KGW News. And here's another way to think about how this will impact each of us, outlined by Al Tompkins from the Pointer Institute. The Fed rates increase will eventually make it more expensive to borrow money, as Evan pointed out. Everything from credit card rates to mortgages will go up. As a result, people will spend less and buy fewer things. When that happens, producers cut their prices to sell off their inventory. That includes airlines dropping prices to fill empty seats and hotels lowering rates to fill empty rooms. Tompkins points out even shoe companies will likely cut prices to get rid of surplus shoes. At the same time, companies will be doing less business, so they will need fewer workers. And they can pay the new ones they hire less money. As fewer people buy new homes, fewer appliances are sold, less furniture as well as the entire economy starts, in theory at least, to cool off and prices come down or at least stop climbing so fast. Now, a wild card in all this is the cost of fuel. It's one of the main causes of inflation right now, and if it stays high while the economy slows, maybe even into a recession, that result will be bad for everyone. So, now you know. It's not just people buying cars or homes that are going to feel this. We will all notice. 
Still ahead, a police officer in Washington put a Nazi symbol on his office door. He probably got fired, right? Wrong. He got paid more than a million dollars to quit. And as you can imagine, a lot of people are outraged. I'm just wondering how I'm going to explain to children as an educator that someone is being given this huge sum of money for doing something wrong. When the story continues. Welcome back. Keep sending your questions and comments to the story at KGW.com or give us a call and leave a voicemail 503-226-5090. Let's get to a story now out of Washington state that's outraged a lot of people across the country. A city near Seattle paid out one and a half million dollars to an assistant police chief who put a Nazi insignia on his office door. Chris Daniels explained what happened and why it has infuriated so many. From a public relations standpoint, this has not been Kent's finest hour. The police department tainted by the actions of one, now former assistant chief, Derek Kamerzell, who was originally suspended for two weeks after displaying a Nazi insignia on his door and making a Holocaust joke in the workplace. He should be answerable for his deeds. That is an insightful Symbol. Yet Rivi Klatenik, the principal of Seattle's Hebrew Academy, is now scratching her head at the punishment. Kent is paying Kamerzell $1.5 million to go away. I'm just wondering how I'm going to explain to children as an educator that someone is being given this huge sum of money for doing something wrong. We came to Kent today to ask questions of Mayor Dana Ralph and Chief Rafael Padilla. They both declined my request for an interview, instead handed me a lengthy statement which read in part that the chief had asked for more money, over $3 million from the city, and that it was determined there would be significant difficulty in him being an effective leader in the police department and it would distract from the mission 
of the city. How can anyone see that as something other than rewarding bad behavior? Adds Klatenik. I also wonder my, about my own grandchildren. How do I explain to my own grandchildren whose great-grandmother, my mother-in-law, was in Auschwitz, and her whole family was murdered, and they did not receive reparations? And how do we deal with that kind of injustice? Good question. Sometimes it seems the world is upside down. A new episode of KGW's true crime podcast, Should Be Alive, is out now. The series examines the 2019 murder of a Vancouver teenager named Nikki Kuhnhausen, who was killed for being transgender. Episode four takes you behind the scenes as prosecutors built their case against Nikki's killer. You'll hear audio from inside the courtroom as the murder trial for David Bognadov began in August of 2021. Bognadov claimed self-defense as his reason for strangling the teenager with a cell phone charging cord. Here's a clip of what you'll hear in the episode number four. As the defendant left Nikki's lifeless 17-year-old body in the large mountain woods, he had decisions to make. Whether to leave behind the phone cord that he'd used to strangle her with. Whether to show up to work that day. Whether to flee the area. His victim, Nikki, would never get to make another decision again. He made sure of that. The only person who knows what happened that night is Mr. Bogdanov. Mr. Bogdanov believes it's important that he tell you what happened. He tell you exactly what happened, and he will testify to what happened that night. You'll also learn what investigators discovered about Bogdanov's trip to Ukraine. He fled there the day he killed Nikki and stayed for six weeks to avoid arrest. If you'd like to learn more about Nikki's case, we have photos, videos, and much more information at kgw.com slash shouldbealive. Episode four of Should Be Alive is available now wherever you get your podcast. We'll release a new episode each Wednesday. Climate scientists agree more frequent wildfires are definitely in our future. But what happens when there's not enough people to fight them? That's a problem Oregon is dealing with right now when the story continues. If you've lived in Oregon for at least the past few years, you know just how bad our wildfire season can get. But now there's major concerns over our shrinking workforce of wildland firefighters. More and more just leaving their jobs, citing low pay, lack of benefits, 
and poor working conditions. Catherine Cook has a look at how lawmakers are trying to stop that trend. Today we are in Alaska uh, at a small cabin in the middle of nowhere. For Matt Monago, it's part of life as a hotshot wildland firefighter. Without hotshots in America, I mean, dang, I, w- I would hate to see what the world would look like without hotshots, to be honest. Monago is a captain with the Prineville hotshots. He took these photos while fighting the Detroit Lake Fire two years ago. He thinks about what this summer will bring. And we want to save as many properties and homes that we can do. He also thinks about Oregon's wildfire workforce. Right now, 20% of its jobs are vacant. We need young bodies to come out and get trained up and be able to do this kind of work. And nobody wants to come out. The problem is not lost on Oregon Senator Ron Wyden. Oregonians were telling me last week, everywhere I went, that the shortage of permanent wildland fire positions, if not addressed, is on its way to becoming a four alarmer. Last week, Wyden asked U.S. Forest Chief Randy Moore about equipping Oregon with more funding, not only to hire more federal firefighters, but to keep others from leaving. Right now, starting wages run from $13 to $15 an hour. I was told last week, if a firefighter in Oregon has a small family and a modest size roof over their head, it takes four paychecks to make a month's worth of rent. Chief Moore says he hopes that will change, possibly through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that Congress passed in November. It includes $600 million for increasing firefighter wages. It's dirty, nasty, hard work, and they do deserve better pay. They deserve better benefits. Monago takes it all with a grain of salt. Things can be better for sure. But as far as any one politician going to bat for us, I mean, I, I mean, I don't not that sound bitter or mean. Like, it, it, it's it's going to take years for it to trickle down to where it needs to go. Instead, he remains focused on what he's certain of: there will be fires, there will be structural threats, and as long as there are hot shots, there will be a response. They're very good people. They're very nice people, and they're they will drop anything they're doing in their life to come to your community and put 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 up a heck of a fight. In Southwest Portland, Catherine Cook, KGW News. Keep sending your questions and comments to the story at KGW.com. Still ahead, how you can help your community.
For this week's Hey Help campaign, we're asking you to donate to our Giving Table. That's a Portland-based nonprofit that helps make sure that foster kids and underprivileged children get enough to eat. They do a lot of work in the summer when the kids can't eat breakfast or lunch at school every day. If you want to help out, just hold your phone's camera up to the QR code on your screen there now, or you can go to kgw.com slash heyhelp. This is a micro donation drive, so feel free to give any amount, no matter how small or how big. That's the end of our program. Thanks for watching. Remember the story, our story, that never ends. I'll see you tomorrow.